Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, Isabel Kelly has been scaling new heights within the music industry. Having worked for music giant Sony, Isabel is now helping to find audiences for independent artists in her role as VP and Global Head of Streaming at Venice Music. Isabel joins us now to share her experience of the music industry. But Isabel, how did you first enter the music business? Good morning, Carl. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I grew up in England to Irish parents, both from Galway. My mum's side of the family, the Dooleys, were very musical. And when I moved back to Ireland when I was nine or ten, I really started getting into performing arts, singing, dancing and the likes. And when I was 18, I then went on to train as a dancer. And then I went to Paul McCartney's music school in Liverpool. For I was there for three years and I did a degree in music with a minor in performing arts. And that's when I really knew music was my love. And from then on, I got a J1 to move over to the U.S. and I landed in New York where I got an internship at RCA Records, which is part of Sony Music Entertainment. And that's kind of when I really fell in love with the music industry. So talk to us about your time with RCA Records and Sony Music and what you learned from working with these global labels. I learned what it was to be like a part of a very big machine. And it is a corporation. Some of the you know big stars we were working at the time were you know Alicia Keys, Justin Timberlake, Kings of Leon, ASAP Rocky. So we're talking about global artists with a, with a huge footprint. And I really saw what it takes for an artist to, to, you know, to reach these, you know, these heights, these global heights of success, and what it takes for the artists and the people behind the scenes. And I also realized how much uh, money it really takes. And which is kind of actually how I segued into the independent music space. Over the course of your own career, the music industry has undergone significant changes. So with the popularity of streaming services, how are labels and artists now generating revenue? Great question. I think, you know, with the influx of streaming and I guess digital download first and then streaming, paired with the rise of social media, I think artists now, they really have to be multifaceted, multifaceted, which is, both a blessing and a curse, I think artists now can find, with their streaming data, which is where I'm a specialist, they can find, really drill down to where their fans are, whether they're in Romania or where they're in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. You know, that information can help you craft your your touring strategy. Um, and I think, you know, touring is really where a lot of artists make the most of their money and merchandise um, directly into their pockets. And so I think, you know, when streaming took over over the last decade, I think it's, you know, there's been both pros and cons, but ultimately it's created a, a whole new plethora of information which artists can transfer, transfer that data into, okay, how am I going to use this information to make myself money in different ways? Makes a lot of sense. Now, when Troy Carter, who was known for managing artists such as Lady Gaga and John Legend, created his new platform, Venice Music, it was you that he wanted to manage it. This must have been an incredible moment for you. Yeah, I mean, Troy Carter is a, a, an absolutely incredible man, um, both just as a friend and a mentor and a manager and a businessman. Um, he himself, you know, started out in, in West Philadelphia, um, born and raised. And, you know, was working with, with Will Smith and, and then with Puff Daddy and then went into management and then he was working at Spotify. So he's an illustrious career and it's not no, no signs of stopping yet. But when I uh, got the opportunity to chat with him and Susie Ryu, the co-founder, I really just was amazed by what they were doing. They were creating tools for independent artists to basically build their own career. And also, you know, when it gets down to the splits of royalties about how artists earn, uh, you know, I've been in the independent sector since 2016 when I started with Barry Weiss. And it just made sense to me. I thought, you know, let's empower these artists to, to make their music. And, and yes, there's, you know, slim chances of becoming a global superstar. But if your hands are in the, dri- in the, in the driving seat, I think artists have far more um, ways of being successful than being almost behind uh, in the back seat when you're at a major label. So provide us with an insight into the tools that are available through Venice Music for artists and how it differs from other music platforms. 
not only do we have the distribution tools where you can upload your your albums, your singles, your artwork, your videos, um, you can upload it on your manager or whoever on your team versus sending it over to anyone else, which, you know, mistakes can be made. People are only human. Um, that's one portion of it. But we really have this absolutely incredible growing community so whereby we have an online platform called Venice Community. And we are actually, myself, head of streaming, the marketing team, the sync team, we are actively giving workshops to people within the community. And we're also asking our uh, managers and our more successful artists to give back to the community. And, and we have various artists that have done talks to, to the really um, new and emerging artists. We've had Troy. Troy was on last night doing an AMA and Ask Me Anything. Um, we've had Rodney Jerkins, which is a Grammy award-winning uh, hip-hop and R&B producer, legendary. And we're basically using our network to help give back to the new generation of artists that are really trying to pave their way within the industry. Isabel, what does your role with Venice Music entail? My role is to essentially help find fans of our artists in the streaming services, whether that be YouTube, Spotify, um, Amazon Music, Audio Mac, Pandora, the list goes on globally. And then we're talking about, um, uh, you know, Tencent out in Asia, we have various streaming um, companies in the in the Asia, especially that's where we're seeing a lot of huge uh, movement come from. My job is to essentially, I listen to the music, I wrangle all of the marketing plans, I really spend my time with the music, listen to it, and I find the story for the artist, and I tell that story to these streaming platforms um, with a hope to find editorial, whether that be on a playlist, whether it be out-of-home marketing, a billboard in Times Square or Leicester Square, um, and really try and find fans of these artists and DSPs and try to build fan audiences. And how important is radio in this multimedia landscape? I mean, radio is still alive and thriving. I think it's more prevalent in certain genres and in certain countries. In, you know, a country like, say, Ireland and the U.K., Radio listenership is very, very high compared to, I think, in the U.S. You have, say, in, in my case, in my job, if you've got a great song that's really building week over week at streaming, maybe that's when you say, OK, I'm going to pay for a radio campaign and build in that radio campaign. And that's where you can see all of the different aspects of um, the way people listen to music tie into one. Can you provide us with any case study examples of artists that have joined Venice Music and how you've helped accelerate their success? One that comes to mind is uh, Thuy, uh, spelled T-H-U-I. She is an American Vietnamese uh, R&B singer-songwriter. She, you know, she started off her career in 2020-2021. She signed with Venice and she's playing Coachella this year as the first ever um, solo Vietnamese American artist, which is a huge feat. Uh, so, you know, she was working a part-time job in in a doctor's um, practice, and she was writing music, and she, her music started taking off, and she decided, you know what, I'm going to focus on my singing career, and she quit her job in the doctor's practice. And one by one, um, you know, fan by fan, as I was saying, we've been able to help her elevate her music. So she's someone who partners with Venice on the streaming side, on the marketing side, and on the sync side. Sync is synchronized to TV and radio or film, uh, TV and film. Um, and so Twee is someone who has been, she started off focusing on her fans in the Bay Area, which is San Francisco, and um, that really just started growing wide and wide. And I think also her story as a Vietnamese American really captured the hearts of Vietnamese American people in America and beyond. And she started... Um, really focusing on her social media and videos. And we started, we started seeing fans all across the world started picking up on her music. And she had a viral song last year, the top 10 and the top viral songs on TikTok last year. And that's all down to hard work. And on the topic of TikTok, Isabel, what positive impact is that having on your own artists? I think what we're seeing with TikTok is 70% of videos being uploaded to TikTok have a musical sound bed on them. And as opposed to Instagram, which I believe is 
uh, much lower, somewhere around 50%. So, you know, love it or hate it, TikTok, I think, is around for the moment. And people are discovering music there. Uh, people are reviving old songs. I know Fleetwood Mac, um, there was a guy on a skateboard drinking cranberry juice about two years ago. He posted a video and that uh, revived um, a Fleetwood Mac record from the 70s. And I think what TikTok is showing us with the younger generations is that they are discovering music from, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago and reviving these. So I think that's something that we always say to our artists, which is you might put out a song and, and it might not reach the amount of people that you wanted it to reach. But, you know, music is forever. And, and who knows, like, that moments like those could be in your future. And I think it, t- TikTok is testament to, to the fact that there's a large audience out there and they are sifting through catalogs of music on TikTok more than any other platform, platform ever before. Now, of course, we've been hearing a lot as well about generative artificial intelligence. How is AI impacting the music industry right now? And how do you think it's going to impact it in the future? Yeah, great question. I think um, AI is definitely is definitely something to be concerned about when it comes to the music industry. I think it's compromising, you know, people and their art. I think, uh, I know Taylor Swift and Drake have had some, and Paul McCartney even, have had some um, big situations where people are imitating them and actually making money off of their face and name and art. Um, so I think that is terrifying. Once we know how to use it correctly uh, and fairly, I think it could be an exciting thing. You know, however many years ago people were terrified of the internet and, uh, you know, we have so much information at the click of, uh, you know, in the flip of a second, and that's fantastic. And people are learning and people are sharing from that. There's obviously downside to the internet. But I think in this early stages of AI and the music industry, it's, it's just a little bit of a grey area. Isabel, what do you think the music world might look like in five years from now? I think a lot more people will be leaning towards companies like Venice Music. I think independence, I think ownership. Uh, I think that is a big, big one for for the music industry. You'll see big um, corporations like Sony and Universal. They're actually buying up independent companies, for example, The Orchard and AWOL. Uh, so I think we're going to see a bit more of a blend of what there is on offer compared to, I guess, what there was 10 years ago, which were uh, limited options. I think people are are day by day just questioning existing um, existing deals uh, that you know labels have with uh, streaming companies and social media companies. So I think we're going to see a lot more fairness. And finally, Isabel, what advice do you have for any Irish music artists that want to progress but in the industry? It's such an amazing renaissance, I think, for, for Irish music right now. Um, you know, I'm constantly looking at, um, you know, all the streaming platforms, Ireland, uh, artists coming out of Ireland. I think for, for a long time, there was a lot of, you know, guitar, pop rock music coming out of Ireland, which we've seen, you know, many people have global success. And I think right now in Ireland, we're seeing a a whole slew of different genres uh, coming out of Ireland. And I think my advice to them would be, I think touring is is, uh, a little easier in Ireland compared to other countries. So I think when you can get out on the road, doesn't matter if it's a, a venue with 20 people, 50, 100, you know, Day by day, they they will start growing. Um, but I think just keep keep at it, and you know, be proud of where you're from. I think Ireland is known for for its poets and its artists and its musicians, and um, just keep keep going. I think the homegrown talent coming out of Ireland is just astounding, and we're really in a Renaissance period. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Isabel Kelly from Venice Music. And I'd like to thank Isabel for giving us a fascinating insight into the business of the modern music world. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.